So hello everyone and welcome. My name is Frank Ruder. I am the convener of the philosophy program or head of department here at the philosophy um, for the philosophy program at the University of Dundee. Um, and in the name of the Scottish Center of, um, for Continental Philosophy and of that said philosophy program, I welcome all of you very dearly to this night's event. Um, it's the first event in 2022 and in the new semester. And uh, let me just quickly say that the next events will take place on um, uh, February 23rd. This event will be a kind of a, uh, have a, a slightly different format. It will be a book presentation of a book written by Slava Zizek, Agon Hamza and myself, and it will be hosted or moderated by uh, Dominic Smith, my colleague Dominic Smith here from the philosophy program at the University of Dundee. Um, the book is called Reading um, Hegel, so um, I will uh, distribute, we will distribute the um, link, Zoom link to that event as we uh, usually uh, do and through channels uh, known to you. Um, before I will introduce, and I will have the pleasure to introduce our um, honorary speaker today. And our, um, let me just quickly say one thing about the format. We will um, um, have the lecture by uh, our guest, um, uh, Professor Monique David Menard, um, for approximately 45 to 60 minutes, and then afterwards we have time for a Q&A. You can do two things. You can put your questions in the chat and I will read them, or if you prefer to speak out yourself, you can raise your um, tiny electronic hands and let me know, and then you can turn on your camera. We're um, um, a nice group of people so that we can without any problem do that. So let me introduce our guest, uh, Professor Monique David Minard. She's Emerita of philosophy, um, um, uh, and she was professor of philosophy at uh, Paris Diderot, uh, Paris Set. Um, she was also directrice um, uh, of the Centre d'études des vivants from 2005 to 2011. She was directrice du programme and then later vice principal of the Collège International de Philosophie in Paris from 1992 to 1998. She is now an associate of the ICI in Berlin and a member of the International Network of the Women Philosophers of the UNESCO. She's also, and that is something um, quite remarkable for a um, thinker of uh, um, David Minar's um, stature, a practicing analyst. That means she always combined three elements in her work, namely a clear and distinct um, 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 emphasis on feminist philosophy, a clear and distinct emphasis on systematic philosophy, and a clear and distinct emphasis on psychoanalysis. After a degree with Paul Ricoeur in 1968 in philosophy, she did her first doctorate in psychopathology and psychoanalysis with Pierre Ferida. Um, a book um, uh, resulted from that PhD, or that PhD resulted in a book in 1983 in French um, and in 1989 in English, um, Hysteria from Freud to Lacan, Body and Language in Psychoanalysis, um, that's Cornell University Press. If you don't know it, read it. It's important and is great. Um, the second doctorate uh, was in philosophy under the directorate of Jean-Marie Bessad. Um, it was published in 1990 as La Folie dans la raison pure, Kant, lecteur uh, de Swedenborg. Um, so madness in pure reason, Kant as reader of Swedenborg. It is equally impressive um, and equally important and equally um, 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 urgent to be read. Um, in 1997, she published Les Constructions de l'Universel Psychoanalyse uh, Philosophie, so Constructions of the Universal Psychoanalysis Philosophy. In 2000, Tout le plaisir est pour moi. Um, all pleasure is mine, uh, or for me. Um, 
uh, Deleuze et la psychanalyse, um, l'altercation in 2005, um, Deleuze and psychoanalysis in 2005, et l'os des hasards dans la vie uh, sexuelle, so praise of chance, maybe chances in sexual life in 2011, and her very much anticipated la vie sociale des choses, l'animisme et les objets in 2020. I hope I haven't missed anything. Um, I'm very much looking forward um, to today's lecture. I'm going to shut up. I'm just going to say um, the I'm going to remind you all of the title of uh, 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 Monique David Minas' intervention. It's Animism of the Owners, Animism of the Poor. How are we today to read Marx's text on property, 1842? Please welcome Monique David Minas. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Frank Kuda, for the invitation. We had four years ago, a very interesting discussion uh, during many days in Slovenia. And uh, so I am very happy to continue today uh, with you and the participant of this seminar or event. Um, the, I will... Uh, speak with, with you to, to this evening of a text I discovered very uh, late when I was uh, writing the last book, The Social Life of Things, Animals and Objects. Uh, in this book, um, I make something very strange. I mixed uh, a reading of Hegel and especially uh, the principle of philosophy of rights, the first part, uh, the property right on property right. I, I compare this and anthropology and psychoanalysis. Anthropology, that is to say, uh, especially the work of Godely, Maurice Godelier, but also of Marilyn Stratham. Uh, Marilyn Stratham, uh, she is not afraid to compare uh, the animist practices in New Ireland uh, to the right of property in our societies, and I made this with the philosophy of right uh, by Hegel. And in the discussion, we can also uh, see why the psychoanalysis, as usual in my work, is has to do with this problem, property, property, identity of subject, objet A by Lacan, uh, what is the crisis of identity who is uh, involved in all the problem we can uh, put on uh, property, inheritance, and so on. But, I was fast finished with the writing of this book when I discover this text of Marx, 1842, uh, on uh, the theft of wood uh, in the assembly of Rhine Rhineland uh, when the status of property changed. And I was very happy because uh, uh, Marx said exactly what I tried to write since uh, six years in this, uh, in this heterogeneous book, uh, naturally, uh, this text, uh, this Marx's text, 
is very short. There are uh, four or five articles in the, uh, uh, in the Rheinische Zeitung, in the, the newspaper, newspaper Rheinische Zeitung. It's a discussion of the debate in the assembly uh, of Rhineland, but it has so much, so many direction that it's, it's difficult to read the text. Uh, the, the Marxist readers uh, in France, I discovered that that text was read. Uh, I discovered that in the book of uh, Dardot et Laval, The Common. Uh, then all uh, Marxist theorists uh, knew now this text uh, on property by Marx. Et c'est sur la révolution au 21e siècle. So I read the text. It was, there is only one uh, translation in French and not, a uh, not as a separate book, but in in an essay written by two uh, people, Pierre Lascombe and Hartwig Zander, the book is entitled Marx du vol de bois à la critique du droit. And then I discovered that other people uh, make commentary of the text, but I think that even if there were interesting one point in this thing in this text is not uh, understood i think it's not only a rational discussion with the deputies uh, on property there is also uh, an anthropologic construction and also uh, the problem is is that and you know the problem in reading Marx is there as Althusser said two Marx the pre-scientific Marx and the other it's true that uh, it's uh, there is not uh, in that direction that we can read the text because it, but it's not only a fantasy, it's more audacious, audacieux. it's a, uh, an invention of many direction of thought. So I begin. Why examine the laws of the theft of wood in 1842? What would happen if we discover that Marx himself did not always retreat into the fixed category that are attributed to him and that his concrete analysis also sometimes offer other direction than those of the critic of the universalist of bourgeois and capitalist law. And that occasionally, for example, he brings an animist component of property into play that is hard to, uh, only to, fit, to fit only within the critic of the formalism of right. The fact the facts in question are now known, but the evaluation of their impact remain thorny. In 1842, Marx wrote, wrote several articles on two matters under discussion in the Rhine Province Assembly concerning, uh, on the one hand, the defense of Moselle wine producers 
And second, the new regulation of the, I quote, theft of dead wood. In the course of the argument that Marx develops, he invokes a right to poverty in the dead wood that has broken off of trees. Poverty senses, he writes, the community to which this, these reputedly natural things belong, along with the destitution of the poor. Here, the new destitution of the poor. In the 19th uh, century. Here, the question is one of an, I quote, instinctive sense of right. For Marx, this serves as the just justification for not considering the collection of fallen wood as a crime, since this act allows the poor to protect themselves from the severity of winter and indeed to remain alive. Uh, I quote uh, one passage because uh, Frank said me that probably you, do, you, you don't know uh, now the text, not yet. I quote Marx, nature itself presents without mediation the antithesis between poverty and wealth in the say in the shape of the dry snapped twigs and branches separated from organic life the the word presents in german is darstellt dar darstellung and not vorstellung representation Human poverty senses this kinship and deduces its right to property from this feeling of kinship. If therefore, the, in German, deduces, it's not the, the word, uh, uh, I, I remember, it's not so intellectual, the, the, the German word. Human poverty senses this kinship and deduces its right to property from this feeling of kinship. If therefore it claims physical organic wealth for the predetermined property owners, it claims physical poverty for need and its fortuity. In this play of elemental forces, Poverty senses a beneficent power more human than human power. Uh, more human, that is, humana, than human power, uh, Marx write, uh, writes mentally. It's not the same word. The fortuitous arbitrary action of privileged individuals is replaced by the fortuitous operation of elemental forces, which take away from, from private property what the latter no longer voluntary foregoes. In this text, in this text by Marx, how can we measure the impact of this immediate impersonal identification of poverty with what has become detached from organic life. An initial layer of Marx's thought is argumentative and rationalist. It first highlights the political importance of legal language showing what happens politically when the deputies confuse the gathering of fallen wood, Graf Holtz Sammel, 
infringement of forest regulation holds Frevel, and the theft of wood holds Diebstahl. This depreciation of legal language ends up ruining the value of the law, of the law he said, the value of the law itself, thereby encouraging crime. In the second article, he considers the notion of customary right and shows that the customary rights claimed by the forest owners exclude and destroy the former customs. On the contrary, the gathering of fallen wood prefigures a right that has not yet found its form and that is valid in all countries. That is to say, it's not the, the customary right uh, from the Middle Age. In the Middle Age, it was a local uh, capacity of the poor people in, uh, in relation with the nobleman in a land. Marx transforms uh, the, the concept of, uh, of uh, customary, customary right. This misleading invocation of the universal by the forest owners, this new right must be valid in all countries, this misleading invocation of the universal by the forest owners finds its initial impetus in the status of the forest wardens. This illusion of legality uh, manifests itself in the exorbitance of the financial sanctions, which Marx will henceforth call surplus value. It's the uh, first. Uh, use of uh, mehrwert, surplus value. Not just uh, because there, there are many, many discussions between the deputy, the bourgeois and the noblemen are not uh, always uh, in agreement. Uh, the discussion is uh, the, the guardian, the, the people who uh, must see if there someone with stolen wood, uh, who will pay them? The cities, the, the owner of the land, or the people who is uh, who is stolen uh, wood himself. All that must be uh, evaluated. And Marx said that uh, the land owners um, let uh, the poor people pay three time for the value of the uh, wood for uh, the salary of the people who are in charge to see if someone is uh, 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 seen. And uh, also uh, uh, the, the other uh, surplus value is the, the expense for the, the process, for the juridical process. The law, therefore, turns a putative crime into a jackpot that goes to the forest owners. Then, the instrumentalization of the state by the forest owners is connected to the predominant role played by financial calculation, which was the only argument that prevailed in the deputy, deputies' debates. 
The third and fourth article detail how the debate on compensation are a relation of power. The last article was written after the deputies adopted the law that Marx why was trying to stop. However, this first presentation is quite incomplete. The articles attack what he names the savagery of the assembly members who idolize their own property while reducing other human beings to the status of dead trees. The short circuit between legal relation and what occurs naturally or spontaneously appears early on in the first article, which was published on the 25th October. Marx not only invoked the nature of things, many commentators said he is he is uh, then he is naturalist. After that, he became rationalist, but it's more complicated. Marx not only invokes the nature of things, but he also presents a kind of never ending game of mirror, mirrors between social realities and natural phenomena. I quote. It would be impossible to find a more elegant and at the same time more simple method of making the right of human being give way to that of young trees. On the one hand, if the deputies adopt the paragraph of the equivalence of the sanction, sanctions for gathering fallen wood and for cutting wood, vivid wood, it is inevitable that many people not of a crum, cr criminal disposition are cut off from the green tree of morality and cast like fallen wood into the hell of crime, infamy, and misery. This is the first, we, we are in now First, it seems to be a comparison. It's not a problematic, it's only a comparison. On the other hand, if the deputies reject the paragraph, there is the possibility that some young trees may be damaged. It, need, it needs hardly be said that the wooden idols triumph and human being are cut down in sacrifice. This passage is the first when the anthropological concept of sacrifice and idolatry uh, comes uh, in, in, in the text. And it's not, it's not uh, just an allusion because all the text has a double construction, rationalist argumentation, and developing the devel construction of this mirror between savages and deputies, and also between social relations and nature, and also religion. Here with the term idols and sacrifice. This game of mirror applies to the forest owners just as much as to the poor. Poverty, this is very interesting in text. Also, uh, the animist people are not just poverty, uh, the bourgeois or, or, and noblemen do have 
their uh, own uh, animism. What could be called the animist move in Marx's text becomes clear through the reference to the idolatry of landowners, of landowners who sacrifice, sacrifice human rights to those of young trees. For example, two deputies disagreed with each other. One, a bourgeois, wished to reduce the infraction of collecting dead wood to a mere fine, whereas another, a nobleman, retorted that in his region, the thieves cut living branches of the tree to collect them, which is a crime. This exclusive interest in living or dead wood possessing divine attributes, attributes takes the place of an interest in human being. No naturalist is to be found there. There is, however, a line or a line of inquiry for an anthropology of religions, which is not reserved for savage. The thematic encompassing living wood and dead wood on the one hand, and on the other, the act of separation, who Thailand mean, means both to separate and to judge in German, separation that the poor and the forest owners themselves carry out, are both connected to a theory of religion and of making idols. The poor who gather dead branches and tie them into bundles join together what nature has already put asunder. The forest owners refuse to let go of that part of their possessions that, had, that has, however, already broken off of them. They associate the vague term theft, both with the attack of trees consisting, consisting in violently removing branches from the, I quote, organic tree, and with the collection of dead branches that nature has already separated from the tree and that have therefore separated themselves from property as well. This problematic of separation has to do uh, with it exactly is the same concept of judgment and uh, uh, separation, Urteilen, than by Hegel. Hegel say that uh, uh, the, the, the work of Verstand, of uh, intellect, uh, has to do with separation, and that is uh, also uh, judgment. And here, on that point, Marx uh, comes very close to, is very close, remain very close uh, to Hegel's. And what is very important is that uh, expression that uh, something is separated from the living tree. The branches are no more living, but nobody uh, has, has decided for that. So, uh, the, the poor people didn't do that, and the owner didn't do that. So uh, the problem is, is there an activity in that? What is the, the mirror between nature and society? 
the, this uh, mirror has the result to 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 express the the question where is the will in the social conflict can we construct a social conflict only with the uh, liberal uh, concept of will here something separates will be separate from the trees but nobody decided that the forest owner owners are incapable of differentiating between the two whereas the role of law and judgment is to do just that to differentiate uh, dead dead tree and living tree and uh, what is uh, to store and what is not to store from the perspective of a classical rationalist approach, the case, I mean, is serious. Marx isn't just a naturalist, it's worse. The grammar he uses makes nature the subject of several social, intellectual, and legal acts with this uh, question of Urteilen. When he points out that the forest owners want to treat the gathering of dead branches as theft and punish it as a crime, he says, as we have seen, I quote again, because the text is a little complicated, it would be impossible to find a more elegant and at the same time more simple method of making the right of human being give way to that of young trees. End of quote. The previous line asserted that in gathering, unlike what happens when leafing branches are cut off, there is no attack against the trees. The short circuit, and it's not an analogy nor a neither an analogy nor a metaphor between the analysis of idolatrous societies and the act of the landowners of the Rhine province assembly, of course, is a very, in the very first article through this reference to the idolatry of food by the wealthy people. Finally, the theme of gold interwoven with the theme of making idols is also referenced in the first article. In their fraudulent use of law to the advantage of the wealthy, the learned jurist term, I quote, every, uh, I quote the translation, but it's a bad translation. Uh, the learned jurors turn every sordid claim into the poor gold of right. In the German text, there is uh, two times the word unlauter und lauter. Sordid claim is unlauter and anmasu, and poor gold of right is. Lauteres Rechtsgold. There is a, a jeu de mots, uh, a witz uh, with the two parts of, of the sentence. And indeed, Marx's last article on the theft of wood concludes with the first late frustrated adoration of gold among supposedly civilized people who are ultimately more savage than the savage in Cuba whose land they invaded. Marx's whole argument is therefore enclosed 
with it, uh, within a kind of rough iron anthropology that should not be dis disregarded. The forest owners are indeed animist since their compulsion to see everything in monetary terms create wooden idols. As for that impersonal subject no, known as poverty, animism prevails for it as well. When poverty gathers twigs, it carries out a judgment, carries out false it, realizes a judgment, it makes on the same time a judgment separation that nature has already handed down. The act of gathering, of bringing together, induces reflection in the passage that follow, uh, the, the passage uh, become quasi crazy. <laughs> uh, the passage that follow on the various way that, that humans, as well as plants, animals and society unite. Nature rids itself of dying branches. Poverty gathers them and bundles them together. However, the allusion to this initial assemblage leads to a discussion of how societies produce unity among, the, among their members in the face of their differences. Here, Mar Marx distinguishes between the feudalism that he wrongly associates with what Hegel calls in the phenomenology of the spirit, the spiritual animal kingdom with so-called so naive feudalism that only brings animal together, he said, in the, I quote, stomach of the beast of prey after being devoured. To start with the first point, the animism of the poor, of poverty. He said non poverty. He makes, and in my title, I, I, in fact, I did that too. Uh, the owners uh, are in plural individuals, but the poor people uh, is poverty. And it's very important because uh, it's, it's not a group. It, it has something impersonal and the problem in the identification with the dead wood uh, is that this substantial, uh, it's not a group, it's substantial poverty. How, uh, how is it possible that it became uh, he became a, a citoyen, a civil, uh, a citizen. Net, je, uh, I quote, uh, I quote uh, Marx, nature itself presents without any mediation the antithesis between poverty and wealth for power, uh, end of quote, for power, poverty, it is a matter of, I quote, a physical representation of poverty and wealth, end of quote. Between the presentation attributed to the instance of nature and the representation that poverty makes makes, there is no break, break. There is in fact a transition. Sentiment is not abandoned in consideration of legal requirement. 
I quote, human poverty senses this kinship and deduced with so that text and the German word is lighted, deduce, deduces its right to power, property from this feeling of kinship. If therefore it, claim, it claims physical organic wealth for the predetermined property owners, it claims physical poverty for need and its fortuity. Too far. In this play of elemental forces, poverty senses a beneficent power more human than human power. The fortuitous arbitrary action, the translation uh, right, rights of privilege, privileged individuals, but there is in, in Marx's text, there are no individuals of privileged individuals is replaced by the fortuitous operation of elemental forces which take away from private property what the latter no longer voluntarily foregoes. End of quote. As far as I know, no one of the translation or analyzers of this passage, passage assign a role to this experience of elemental forces. If elements, even dead ones, are more human than humans, how can Marx be called a naturalist? The best development of the theme of, of, the theme of separation from what is alive concerns fallen wood. The bilberries or cranberries gathered by poor children are less dead than dead twigs and do not present a contrast as clear cut and lasting between what is alive and what has died and separated itself from a living object, the tree. Marx does not just contrast the living with the dead. He places particular emphasis of the theme as we saw of separation. So the forest owners who demand new property rights can no longer, no longer separate themselves from that which has already separated itself from the reality of, the, of what they possess. So the play, the mirror play is very complex in that uh, problematic. In identifying the theoretical gesture of this text, you, the usual distinction between natural and right is not enough. I mentioned that Marx undermined the relevance of the distinction between nature and right all the way through these articles of the theft of wood. We may add that this way of discussing social relations by embedding them within nature undermines to a certain extent the distinction between nature and culture since the various types of culture he examines are constantly compared or involved in compared to forms of animal life. I think uh, the, the word compared is to external, to, to understand or to explain the play of mirrors. This eventually leads him to conclude that the most savage, savage culture of all is precisely, precisely that of the Rhine Province Assembly. This is 
what I call the short circuit and not the analogy or metaphor between savagery and parliamentary debate. And yet the theme of nature expressed in a variety of anthropological form is indeed what structures this short circuit. Throughout this text of Marx, there is a line of thought that in, is insistently interwoven with a critique of the deputy's false reasoning. I propose to call, to call this line of thought animist because I work well on a special comprehension of animism. So I will now uh, better uh, explain or develop what Marx uh, calls idolatry in the, that text. Because uh, until now, there are only some allusions. I noted the strange assertion, the one that commentator mentioned most often without making its status any clearer by doing so. This idea that custom and the right, right associated with it take on a completely unprecedented meaning when this concerns a right to pro poverty in the world that property law put, puts in place. This is, this is not a customary right in the usual sense of the privileges of those who belong to a community or a state, because precisely what poverty senses in the, this mirror of itself that the wings represent, is that it does not attain the status of citizenship. We could even say that by way of the tweaks which we, with, with which it identifies, this class deprived of everything comes into contact with itself. I quote again uh, Marx, again, but it's not the uh, the same text. It will be found that the customs, which are customs of the entire poor class, are based with a sh sh sure instinct of the indeterminate aspect of property. It will be found not only that this class feels and drive the German word is trib, and drive to satisfy a natural need, but equally that it feels the need to satisfy a rightful drive. Fallon would provide an example of this. In these customs of the poor class, therefore, there is an instinctive sense of right. Their roads are positive and legitimate, and the form of customary right here conforms all the more to nature because up to now, to now the existence, because up to now, the existence of the poor class itself has been a mere custom of civil society a custom which has not found an appropriate place in the con conscious organization of the state. When we read these pages, we may see nothing other than the first formulation of, we have been not, we shall be all from the international. However, we note that surprisingly, surprisingly, that the description of this instinctive sense of right, living within the passivity of the connection that is felt with Fallenwood, concours 
that was the theme of my book, concours with Freud's description of the immediate identification, which is neither a deduction nor a judgment by which we identify another by being that other ourselves. If you want, we can go again to that problematic. They are the same words in Freud in the text on the unconscious and in Marx to describe this immediate feeling, immediate identification who is not uh, a, uh, a log logic or intellectual uh, reason, mode of reason. Here, Marx describes a relation to something that had detached it itself, shed itself from civic existence, like the skin of a reptile that becomes external to it, inanimate. We can make a joke why it's also the statute of the object R by Lacan. Uh, this theme of separation and this this is a comparison uh, like the skin of a reptile that becomes ex external to it inanimate the method did not also uh, only a comparison but th this uh, passage is a comparison but poverty feels itself to be identical to that which is shed in nature. In this play, I quote, in this play of elemental forces, elemental forces and not individuals, in this play of elemental forces, poverty senses a beneficent power more human than human power. Why more human here? Nature is more human than human insofar as it takes into account what they law, the 1842 law conceals. And yet, this degeneration of, I, I don't know, degradation or social decline in this degradation it identifies an activity that in fact serves as the basis for a right. Gathering, just as it is not fitting for the rich to lay claim to arm distributed in the street, it's a quotation, I began quotation, just as it is not fitting for the rich to lay claim to arm distribute, distributed in the street. So also in regard to this arm of nature, but it is by its activity to that poverty acquires is its right. So the play, the mirror play uh, continue in detail with the comparison uh, between comparison or uh, play of mirror between the arms distributed in the street, that is a social relation, and uh, the, the fallen wood in nature. And then the relation is inverted. We are beginning with the social relation, and that social relation exists also in nature. But what is strange about this connection that is felt between nature and poverty is that it also participates in reflection on animality in social issues on, and on the savagery in the literal sense of the term of a society where everything is measured in value, a society that devises punishment that are financially equivalent to the crime. 
On this point, it is not clear that Marx is a Hegelian. When he makes a distinction between uh, feudalism, the regime of fiefs and serfdom, fiefs and serfdom, naive feudalism, the caste system, and savagery, uh, 16th century Cubans, but also the 19th century Rhine province assembly. He is not an evolutionist like Hegel. He organizes a short circuit between his contemporary and savage that must be approached carefully. As we, as we see, Marx declare in October 25, feudalism is the spiritual animal kingdom. And it's uh, an error uh, with Hegel. The sense of this expression is, by Hegel is something, something else, but it's not the, the important point. Naive feudalism by Marx is a system of caste whereby groups are separate, separated from each other, unable to access what is common to them, their genius. Here again, we note the importance for the Hegelian Marx of the stem of a universality, still and impersonal one of the genius. The animals are unable to attain it, and the members of the, so the society living under so-called naive feudalism are animals who only identify with individuals on the same species and who therefore kill those outside of it. In the caste system, where the social groups are compartmentalized, unity is produced in the stomach of the beast of prey who devours the other's animal. The species, I quote, assert their particular distinctive characteristic one against another. In the stomach of the beast of prey, nature has provided the battlefield of union, the crucible of closest fusion, the organ connecting the various animal species. Similarly, under feudalism, one species feeds at the expense of another. And then when the privileged classes appeal from legal right to their customary rights, they are demanding, instead of the human content of right, its animal forms, its animal form, which has now lost in re its reality and become a mere animal mask, end of quote. And then uh, this problematic of the animal mask has to do, Marx said, with the history of religion in ancient Egypt, the god, the god has uh, animal as, as the face of an animal. And the uh, owners, the land owners in, in the 19th century, make the, an e idol with the wood and also the, with the plus value of uh, the punishment. And then they are like animal god in ancient Egypt. It's a little fast crazy, but in the same time, very interesting. Naturally, 
we can say that it's uh, the first version of fetishism, naturally. But I think the relation between anthropology and uh, analysis of the commodity is more complex here than in fetishism. And the, uh, especially the relation between religion, animality, nature, and social relation. Here, Marx in neither humanist nor anti-humanist, he projects the human realm back onto the predatory animal world, whereas the forest owner claim to be humanists. They derealize humanity by giving it a mask of animality. Masks play a role in ritual among the savage, the savage, the savage, the sauvage. This ignorance of the human realm is therefore an idolatrous mask as well. Indeed, men in such a society who simultaneously recognize and misrecognize what they do, worship animality as a good, like in ancient, ancient Egypt, as a god, excuse me. Religion simultaneously absolutizes and misrecognizes the inability of those men to envisage a community and make it a reality. Finally, and I am uh, with this, I, I will be finished in my reading of that text. Finally, there is a third reference to the idolatry that is constitutive of regi religious societies. It appears in Marx's text, after the vote on the law that despite Marx's precise and casting articles, did in fact define the gathering of fallen wood as theft and establishing the severe penalties that applied. Marx confirms this is an act of savagery, but the Rhineland savage on the 19th century are worse than those of Cuba, for they misrecognize their own fetish wood, in particular when it becomes a commodity. Marx's last article on the matter ends on the very same theme with which his first article began. He clarifies the impact of the short circuit between the savagery of colonized, colonized people, colonized peoples, and that of the 19th century bourgeoisie. In Cuba, the savage has understood that the Spanish invaders fetish, fetishized gold, fetishized, fetishized gold. I quote, they celebrated a feast in its corner, sang in a circle around it, and then threw it into the sea. End of quote. If the savage attended the debate of the Rhine province assembly, they would understand that wood is the fetish of the Rhinelanders whose local legal practices amount to animal worship, with which fetishism is always associated. For Marx, capitalism is not the only fetishistic society, but it knows far more about the fetishes or of savage than it does about its own 
and it is consequently all the more ignorant of the social violence that is masked by animal or things, in particular those abstract things known as property and commodities. How are we to co comprehend these abiding connections between what is not yet called alienation of human relation among the living trees or the dead branches on the one hand, on, and on the other, the mirror effect of societies, animals, and dead detritus kept off with a critique of religion. What takes place in Marx's text when he discusses social relation by placing several forms of human communities and several norms of universality within so-called called natural kingdoms. And what if that constant game of mirrors between humanity and what is taken to be nature, instead of being a form of humanist and a still hesitant critic of the abstraction of human rights, was actually a kind of cannibal metaphysic as uh, Eduardo Vivero de Castro put it in his book, Metaphysic Cannibal. In other words, it's not a matter of believing in nature from which various kinds of increasingly rationalist community have become alienated in the reality of the social relation and the ideas that they have, they have of that, that themselves. It is instead one of undoing the transcendence of political reason by immersing it simultaneously into animality and into religion as the blind sentiment behind the violence of those relations. Let's see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monique, for this absolutely beautiful and stunning and daring and very challenging uh, paper. Um, I think um, we, without any um, detour, we can directly uh, move into um, the discussion. There was, uh, okay, there are already things in the chat. Um, there is a citation um, that Murray left um, for us. Um, do you want to come in, Murray, as long as you're here, or shall I just read it um, as you prefer? Uh, I don't want to force you. Yes, this is the, the quotation. From the Grundrisse. Um, Sometimes yeah. I change the word when there is a contresens. When, when the translation is too bad, it, it, it's not correct. Uh, when I read the translation, I, I, uh, I change one word. But uh, in, in that, uh, in that quotation, no, I read exactly that. Do you want to come in, Mary, for that? Sorry. Uh, I'm not. Uh, is this the quotation from the Grundrisse that you're looking at there? Grundrisse? The, 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 uh, I, I was just about to, um, to leave. Uh, yes, I, I was uh, reminded about uh, uh, something from um, the introduction to Marx's Grundrisse. Uh, All production is appropriation of nature on the part of an individual within and through a specific form of society. In this sense, it's a tautology to say that property appropriation is a precondition of production. And I was uh, uh, curious to, to know where, um, uh, where, where production um, fitted in with the, the, the animist 
uh, kind of uh, interpretation. He that makes sense. He he speaks not yet of production. He speaking speaks not yet of proletariat, and uh, so can. Uh, so what he seems to be saying here is that the production and property can't can't be separated. Uh, it's a tautology to say that property is a pre precondition of production. And that, and that may be a, a later, um, uh, well, it is uh, a bit later from from Marx. So it, it is. Uh, I think we must not reconstruct the later Marx. Okay. <laughs> uh, in such a, uh, uh, the, the, the point, for example, uh, in the, the commentators, for example, uh, Dardo and Laval, mm -hmm. and also uh, Lascou Menzander, uh, will say, for example, that the, the poverty in that text prefigures proletariat. But, and uh, we don't need all this animist atmosphere. But there is one of the commentators, a professor uh, in law, in a law school in Paris, uh, Mikhail Xifaris, who said that uh, in a, in an article published in um, I would dire, voilà, Mikhail Xifaras, in an article Illegalisme et droit, Illegalisme and right, in the Illegalisme et droit de la société marchande. De Foucault à Marx. It was in the newspaper Multitude uh, in 1995. Uh, Michael Xifaras, professor in law, said that Marx uh, understands something in the 19 uh, society more. Uh, more adequate than Foucault. Why? In uh, Surveiller et Punir, Foucault writes that uh, the modification of uh, the art of punishment uh, in 19th century after uh, uh, has to do with um, criminal law. That is to say that uh, there is uh, the, the, the criminal, and for example, he cites the, the, the text, uh, Marx text uh, on the Fallen Wood. Uh, and Mikhail Xifara said, no, uh, Foucault uh, didn't understand that it's not a question of criminal law, it's a question of uh, civil right. It's the moment, Marx identifies the moment when property, when the new definition of uh, a member of a society is le patrimoine. That is to say, all the belonging of someone is the, the art, how someone became a citizen. And then it creates a new exclusion, that poverty. Uh, and it's not a question of uh, criminal law, as Foucault said. Uh, 
in a special location of the society. Apparently a small, uh, it's apparently a small point, this affair with uh, the dead wood. But in that point, all the society is changing. And Marx understands that better than Foucault, for example. Uh, and uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's a question of, yes, it, it is the invention of the patrimoine. You are a social uh, existing being only when all you belonging uh, define you. And, and this is the importance of the text. And uh, it's on the rational level. It's uh, not yet this problem of the idolatry uh, uh, and the, the this uh, game of mirror between nature and sociality uh, in uh, the juridical problem marx identifies a new mode of sociality and it doesn't have say say xifaras it doesn't have to do directly with the analysis of production and surplus value. But it's interesting that the word surplus value comes in that apparently uh, not, uh, it's that uh, problem who apparently is just a detail. Uh, naturally, uh, the capital is not yet there. Okay, but something else is there. And uh, I would say uh, it's like in my reading of Hegel the problem is not only the relation between the economic organization of capitalism and the the state, that is to say, in Marx, economy, politique, political economy, critique of political economy, that is to say, there is no real independence on the organization of production uh, in, and the role of the state. And it was exactly the same in, uh, but no. There is no independence uh, between the spheres. In civil society, there are situations or problems who can change the sociality itself, and not only in relation between state and uh, civil society. We can say that uh, uh, Marx, after that, changed his mind, perhaps, but, uh, but, but, but this relation uh, between A specified sphere of sociality and a global change, I think, is very interesting. Nat naturally, uh, the problem uh, between infrastructure and superstructure has to do with that. Uh, but uh, well, I don't know if uh, if it's. Uh, an answer, a response to 
your intervention. Hello, Frank Kuda, human property sensor. Yes, so, okay. uh, um, there is another question by uh, Paris Levitis. Um, just come in, Paris, please. Who who is uh, who is speaking? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm here. Uh, thank you very much for the for the talk today. Um, uh, a lot of very interesting issues, and one issue that I wanted to bring out um, uh, when thinking about this uh, difference between the Latinate uh, 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 and uh, Menschische, the Germanic Menschische, um, that this is very similar to something I remembered from Hegel, uh, his use of Latin uh, root words in particular. Uh, I remember this passage from the Hernext dialectic um, uh, that where he uses person instead of uh, mensch uh, to designate person. the uh -huh. uh, to designate the half person, um, you know, not the full person, the individual who is uh, who be will become the the the, um, the bondsman, uh, the uh -huh. connect. Um, and uh, I was, my first thought was that this uh, elevation of the Latinate version uh, seems to be uh, almost the opposite of a, uh, a run of the mill uh, reading of Hegel, where uh, the Latinate is lesser than the Germanic, that the, in fact, something about this inhuman Latinate uh, stem is actually dignified by Marx. And the way that I put it in the question was uh, where the alienation or the recognition of alienation, um, the speculative identity between the deorganicized excess of the branches and the deorganicized excess of the branch collectors, the poor, um, is taken as a kind of uh, inhumanity constitutive of, of the human. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and of course, this is a, a, a so the, the, the first thought is, is this, this uh, uh, distinction Marx makes uh, almost seems to elevate the inhuman um, through the Latinate word. And then I, I brought this further because this has a bit of an ambiguity. And I, I, I brought to, I, I, I thought of uh, this quote from Deleuze and Guattari, um, yeah, from, really. yeah, <laughs> on theft, which is a very interesting point, I think, uh, from uh, L'Antiedip. Um, uh, le vol qui empêche les dons et les contre-dons d'entre dans une relation échangiste. Le désir ignore uh, l'échange. Il ne connaît que le vol et le don. Um, so, uh, the more or less classic uh, Lacanian response to this would be, of course, desire doesn't know anything about exchange, uh, but the drive does. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, the drive does precisely because there is a theft involved. Um, the lost mm -hmm. object, or even in the, na the neighbor paradox, um, the, the f stolen enjoyment. And so it really puts into question whether or not, um, especially with all this business about uh, the trib and the resonance with Freud and of course Lacan's analysis of uh, the plus value as uh, plus de jouir, right? um, whether this manages to be actually uh, contrary to a, a proprietal economy or apparatus, a dispositif or whatnot, or if it indeed is the constitutive moment of uh, constituting this, that, uh, okay, there's this dignity to the inhuman, uh, but at the same time, this dignity of the inhuman is exactly what uh, the economy is founded on. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that's, that's where I'm going with my thinking. I hope uh, that forms a bit of a question for uh, something for you to It's not a question, but it's an interesting uh, remark. Naturally, in reading the, that text, I had always in mind the, the, the chapter in uh, L'Antiodip called Sauvage, Barbare, Civilisé. Uh, it's uh, this violent uh, and rough anthropology. It's exactly the method from Deleuze et Guattari in Antiodip, not in uh, Thousand Plateau. It, after that, it's something else. But uh, this uh, 
seemingly uh, evolutionism who begins with uh, savagery until now, but it's it's not an evolutionism because uh, the, the, the the distinction between nature and culture is by in the text deconstructed and also because the savages are installed are put in our world directly uh, uh, yes and so but uh, thank you for the the, the, the the reference to Hegel, I didn't. Uh, where is it in Hegel? This uh, distinction between person and uh, human—it's not the same. Human and human. Yeah. yeah. Human and menschly in uh, in uh, Marx and uh, persons—that is the abstract idea of abstract right. It's a juridical person and uh, he's very, 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 uh, he makes, Hegel makes a very strong critique of the abstract, abstract right uh, in phenomenology, phenomenology of the spirit and also uh, in the first part of uh, philosophy of right. Uh, but is that another passage where person does have another sense as the juridical sense? No, no. The, the, this this is the passage of uh, the uh, part A of the Selbstbewusstsein um, uh, chapter. Yeah. The quote is: "Das das Individuum welches das Leben nicht gewagt han, hat." Uh, kann wohl als Person anerkannt werden. Uh, so it's at the moment when the, you know, before the hypothetical death that the, uh, the loser is saved and becomes the, the connect. Uh, but I, all I was uh, pointing to was that this juridical meaning, as you say, is abstract. And so it's lesser, it's inferior, it's undignified. Um, whereas the, 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 the Latinate uh, humaner in in um, in uh, Marx is the the more dignified form, and so it's like he's dignifying a certain inhuman uh, yes, part of the yes, human. Yes, 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 yes. That yeah. is true. That is exactly that. Yeah, and it's not it, not only uh, the first formulation of proletariat in in. in that sense, there is a reserve, yeah, une reserve de pensée. Uh, mm -hmm. It can be developed in another direction, I think, than, than what comes after. Thank you. Um, I, I have a, <clears throat> if, I, if I may, uh, I have a quick, quick, sort of quick question about one implication of what you um, pointed out so beautifully when you described the processes of identification with Deadwood going on. Mm -hmm. Because if I understood your emphasis correctly, uh, the emphasis on Urteil, what you call Urteil without agency, right? So there is some kind of <clears throat> splitting or separation going on at the very foundations of the kind of society that capitalism is, right, in the, this early text. But that also means that even separation must be separated, right? There is not only one type of separation, but there are two types of separation. Separation is inherently not one, but two, right? There is let's say yeah. the, the, uh, right i mean there there are two types of dead branches there's two types of deadening going on and the one is the deadening of the owners and the other one is the deadening which is also i mean the very life principle in some sense of capitalist mm -hmm. society right um the the other is the deadening deadening of the worker um <clears throat> i was wondering couldn't one therefore say 
that it is, and that is Marx's um, essential non-Rousseauism on that point. Non-Rousseau? Uh, it's the anti-Rousseauism of, of Marx, that the assumption is not that one needs to emphasize the social bonds. I mean, right, the early Marx is always read as an Aristotelian, as someone who insists on the naturally given social quality of uh, human beings, but that Marx shows the emancipatory potentials, uh, potentials of yeah. asociality, right? There are two yeah. types of asociality and one, the politicization of a certain type of asociality, the non-capitalist type might actually lead to a transformation of the social order. But, but it would be wrong to think one could straightforwardly simply change sociality, but one needs to go through the asocial route by separating separation um, from itself somehow and invent a new type of asociality, a new type of... Yes. Does that make sense to you? Yes, yes, yes. It's true that uh, uh, he, he plays with the word of uh, Urteil, uh, uh, and say that separation, Hegel say separation is something very serious. Uh, it's naturally, it must be transformed uh, into dialectic separation, that is the, the Kantian uh, conception of thought. And uh, Hegel must go uh, elsewhere, but he said nevertheless that uh, Urteil is both a mode of thought and an action, you said an agency who can disting make uh, the good distinction in the things and just uh, uh, the, the the landowners and the bourgeois uh, will uh, use the law for another usage. And so, um, can, we, can we read Marx's text as, uh, yeah, as a, 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 there is a reserve of sociality in the art sociality, uh, perhaps I didn't uh, thought, uh, but uh, I didn't think. Uh, but it's a possibility. Yes, it's a. If that were the the, the, the case, this is why I'm asking. One could separate politics yes. from political action from social interaction. Right. I mean. The, that is that is a distinction that is often lost in let's say social ontology. I mean, think of Axel Honneth. He can't make this distinction. I don't have anything against personally against Axel Honneth, but he couldn't make this distinction be between because for him social interaction is political or political action is social interaction. Mm -hmm. but Marx seems to make a different point, right? Mm -hmm. um, that um, one needs to separate political organization and not and not overly in political action, political collective action, not immediately identified with social interaction because otherwise it is immediately. Yes, it's not social interaction, it's the creation uh, in what is not yet created, what doesn't have uh, yet a, a shape. Uh, yes, yes, it's true. I didn't thought that it could be have a, a relation a reference with Honet, but it's true. Yes, naturally. Yeah, well, I mean, then, then Marx would be the anti Honet somehow, but uh, <laughs> but that that might be good news. Okay, we have one final question. Um, so Christian, please come in. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, can you can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, uh, thank you so much for for that fascinating talk. 
Um, I, I, I was wondering if I could tap into your knowledge a bit more um, regarding also the topic of uh, dead wood, but from a bit of a, another perspective. Um, so I, I was just wondering, because it seems to me that um, it's uh, the exact inverse uh, relation to Locke's idea that appropriating nature grounds property rights in the first place. And, and here you have um, the fact uh, that there is an act of, 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 the, of the poor people um, to appropriate dead nature as something that exceeds property rights. Um, and and I, I, I really um, noticed uh, in your talk, you, you said something is separated, but nobody decided that. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it seems that this aspect of, of dead wood and obviously being separate from, from conscious decision. Also, I think you mentioned uh, the, the, the liberal idea of, of will. So it's, it's, it's something different. And, and um, I, I, in, in, in later Marx in Capital, uh, he, he seems to go exactly that route of, um, uh, of, of a conscious decision because it, it, there's this definition of labor that is in the first place a process which both man and nature participate and in which man of his own accord starts, regulates, and controls the material reactions between himself and nature. So I, I'd be really interested to hear what, what you would say to that. Thank you. Yes, yes. It, it's true that um, um, the problem is uh, that it's true that the later Marx is most uh, give, put the emphasis of the mastery of the of nature of the the the, the, the the production and the alienation of a part of the proletariat and the ideal the ideal is uh, is not to let uh, <laughs> a, a, a process without subject to work. We can say that this substantial process here in our text, uh, it's a process without subject because the political subject is not yet there. It's not yet the proletariat. It's not active and rational on a certain level it's rational but in the same time it, there is a sort of confusion in the production of social relations uh, so nobody uh, has a the mastering of the revolution. And it's true that uh, after that, perhaps, and my question would be, why it's also the, the, the question but of Althusser, but I don't have the same answer to the question. Why is the text on fetishism? in Capital uh, Volume 1. If in the capitalist, in the, in the book of uh, political economy in capitalism, uh, we don't need, or, or we need only rationalism mode of, see, of thought, why do this, uh, repetition of the theme of poverty and uh, uh, money, gold as uh, idol, new idol. Uh, is that is there a line by Marx in mixed with? his rationalism, I don't say under 
is rationalism. I say mixed with his rationalism. Uh, and perhaps in each philosophy, there are these two levels. I, I see that uh, my book on Kant uh, was also to detect in the uh, very strong uh, construction of the critique of pure reason, a text uh, inter, inter, it's not under the text, it's in the text, but there are uh, several uh, lines in the text itself. And uh, perhaps the problem is the same by Marx, uh, I would say. But it's true that uh, in Le Capital, he insists on the, on the rationalist version of its thought and of his uh, discover. Yeah. Thank you so much, to... Monique. I think that was. Um... Absolutely fantastic. Um, um, and uh, more than rich. And um, I thank you so much. I'm really deeply grateful for uh, you sharing this with us and discussing this with us. Um, I hope the next time we will see each other, we will see each other again in person okay. and we need okay. to bring you here. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you for that yes. uh, wonderful discussion and talk. Um, and I wish you all a lovely evening. Special thanks again to Monique David Binar for this um, absolutely extraordinary presentation. Thank you thank very you. much to you, to all of you. Thank you, and thank you a lot, Frank. Bye. 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 Bye.